On This Week in Enterprise Tech, it's a preview of Enerop 2015. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyatt, This Week in Enterprise Tech, Episode 137, recorded April 24th, 2015. Interop Preview. This episode of Twyatt is brought to you by ProFlowers. Mother's Day is May 10th, and ProFlowers has got you covered. Get one dozen rainbow roses and a free glass vase for just $19.99 plus shipping. Visit ProFlowers.com, click the microphone in the top right corner, and enter the code TWIT. And by PagerDuty. PagerDuty decreases alerting noise for IT operations and developers to ensure that the right engineers are notified at the right time. Increase your uptime and sign up for a 14-day free trial at pagerduty.com slash twit. And by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 50-plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash twiet. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash twiet. Welcome to Twyat This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Palliser, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. But of course, I ain't guiding you alone. I've got my regular cast of characters, starting with Mr. Brian Chi, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. Brian, where are you? I am currently on the show floor of the Interrupt Trade Show, and you might actually hear some forklifts and snorkel lifts going by every once in a while, so we do apologize. This is a construction zone. Yes, also in a construction zone, which is strange that they would both be in a construction zone at the same time, is Mr. Curtis Franklin from Information Week Radio. Curtis, what construction zone are you in? Well, oddly enough, Padre, I'm in the very same construction zone as uh, Brother Brian here. We are actually sitting about three and a half feet apart, just um, gazing fondly at one another while we're doing Twyat. That, that, that was a little creepy. So we're going to get past the creepy and go straight into the Enterprise blips. This first one, well, I can't say that I'm not saying it with a little bit of relish and happiness, but Comcast Time Warner is dead. After 18 months of posturing, tens of millions in legal fees, astroturfing, and questionable lobbying tactics, Comcast is dropping its $45 billion bid for Time Warner Cable. The change of heart comes after the FCC and the U.S. Department of Justice both voiced serious concerns about what the deal would mean for competition in the already stilted broadband market. There is no financial penalty for Comcast, as there have been in other high-profile takeover failures, but the publicity that the aborted merger has brought is most definitely not in the favor of incumbent ISP, stopping just short of collusion to break the terms of the 1986 Cable Communications Act. Though this has been a long saga and one that is probably not over, in the end, what killed the deal was that neither Comcast nor Time Warner were able to adequately answer the question, how would less competition serve the consumer? Microsoft's cloud march continues because on April 23rd, that would be yesterday, Microsoft reported $21.7 billion in revenue, 61, per, 61 cents earnings per share, uh, compared to a $21.1 billion uh, estimate. Now, transformational is a good word for what was going on this quarter because it saw tremendous success across cloud services and a decline throughout Microsoft's traditional offerings. Microsoft's commercial cloud business saw 100%, 106% growth. Boy, it's hard to even say that about a business. And it had a run rate of $6.3 billion. This marks an increase of $5.5 billion from the previous quarter. Office 365, Azure, and Dynamic CRM were the primary drivers behind this commercial cloud success. The weak spots in Microsoft's quarter three report were related to Office 
and Windows software, which were both affected by a lagging PC market, among other factors. Revenue from Windows licensing dropped 19% for businesses after spiking the previous year but, uh, after the announcement of the end of Windows XP support. Windows licensing revenue for consumers fell by 26% in the third quarter. The takeaway, Satya Nadella's strategy is working and the future looks cloudy for Microsoft. Well, a big congratulations to the Netherlands High Tech Crime Unit. Seems our friends in the Netherlands managed to snag a pretty big cache of keys when they seized the Coin Vault server. The resulting key cache was turned over to the Kaspersky folks, who then created the No Ransomware decryption tool. While it certainly isn't 100%, it does go a long way uh, to raining on the ransomware parade. Good one, folks, and mega congrats to everyone involved, and my sincerest thank you. Well, it's official. Microsoft's not the only player in cloud. Amazon Web Services is a $4.6 billion business. As they promised, Amazon broke out their web services in a separate category for their latest earnings report. And the numbers are, well, huge. AWS grew 49% in 2014 and pulled in $4.6 billion. It's on track to pull in $6.23 billion by 2015. That's still a small fraction of the company's overall revenue, 7% of the $22.72 billion Amazon made in the first quarter of 2015. But the profit margins make it by far the biggest moneymaker for the online giant. Add in much faster growth, and AWS is now officially a monster. Well, biometrics are heading to the world of behavior. Fingerprints and retinal scans are hard to spoof, but they're static data that can be stolen or worse yet, force users to go through yet another pesky step in the authentication process. New technologies may monitor things like mouse dynamics, navigation habits, and keystroke dynamics, like the speed you type and the pressure you hit the keys with, gesture dynamics like swipe speed and distance, all these sorts of things you do unconsciously, but in a very unique way. Now, this week at the RSA conference, two companies showed operations in this space. New Data Security and Behaviosec are device agnostic solutions that continually monitor these things. This does appear to be one of those topics that's going to continue to grow because other companies have announced that they're going to be coming in and playing. They're just not quite ready to show it yet. One way or another, this leads to the kind of world where your computer might be able to recognize you and authenticate you as a user when you walk in the room before you ever sit down and type the first word. Tired of worrying about stingrays? Pony Express just released a possible solution for you. At the recent RSA conference, Pony Express demonstrated a new feature of their Pulse security auditing service and the, the ability to detect if a stingray is in operation in your area. With the cost of software-defined radios dropping in price, building a Stingray has dropped into the $1,500 range, putting the general public in danger from more than just the FBI's flying Stingrays. Now, here's some big news. Dell is going after Cisco in the data center. Going after the high end of the top-of-rack aggregation and access layer market, Dell expanded their line of data center Ethernet switches with a new 100-gig product, that can divide its ports into 25 and 50 gig channels. The first offering in this class is the Z9100, a 1U fixed form factor switch that can be configured with 32100 gig, 6450 gig, 3240 gig, 128 25 gig, or 128 plus 2 10 gig ports. The new switch competes squarely against Cisco's Nexus 9504 and Juniper's QFX10002, while offering higher port densities and lower per port cost. Since 100 gig ports are currently going for about 5K without optics, and the Z9100 will run 3K per 100G port with optics. Look for it in the second half of 2015. Well, folks, that's it for the blips. We're going to get on to the bites. But first, I want to thank the first sponsor of this episode of this week in Enterprise Tech. Now, I know, I know, trust me, I know that you are a hardcore grizzled IT guy. Yeah, you've seen it all. You memorize the MAC addresses of 2,000 plus servers in your data closet. You don't spin up virtual machines until the second that they're needed. You laugh at people who don't know that cloud just means someone else's computer. But as hard and grizzled as you are, 
you know, because of course you faced data death, you still need to show that soft spot. You still need to show you care. You still know, need to show the people in your life that you care about that you can be more than just another IT guy. Which is why we're going to throw you a hook with ProFlowers.com. Now, what is ProFlowers? ProFlowers is a place on the web to get the best bouquets, the best arrangements, and pretty much the best gifts that you can give to the people that you love. A Mother's Day is coming up this Sunday, May 10th, and... Uh, well, it's going to be here before you know it. The question is, will you be ready? With ProFlowers.com, you can be. And Zach, if you go ahead and move on over, we can show you how you can appreciate your mom this Mother's Day. And, uh, well, it doesn't have to be stressful. ProFlowers makes buying a beautiful gift for your mom simple and quick. And they've got everything that you need for Mother's Day. It's for all the moms in your life. You choose the delivery date that you want, and it's guaranteed. And best of all, their flowers are guaranteed to be fresh and beautiful for at least seven days after you receive them. Now, yeah, I, I know, you're a geek, so you're going to think maybe my mom's going to want something technological. Maybe my mom's going to want the newest Apple Watch. Maybe my mom wants the newest MacBook. But I got to tell you, there's nothing quite like having a fresh bouquet of flowers. Something that says, yeah, you know what, I thought about this more than just my average everyday life living in the data center. And that's what Pro Flowers is all about. Give the ones you love something beautiful, something that smells aromatic, something that reminds them that you care. Now, there's going to be those of you who say, but I don't understand flowers. I don't know how to choose bouquets. I don't know what it takes to put together an arrangement. Well, you don't have to worry about that because Pro Flowers has experts that take care of all that for you. Now, this Mother's Day, we want you to try Pro, Pro Flowers. They're guaranteed. They've got the beautiful arrangements that you want, and we've got a special offer for fans of Twit. Get one dozen rainbow roses in a free glass vase for only $19.99 plus shipping. Or you can upgrade to two dozen in a free glass vase for $9.99 more. Visit ProFlowers.com today. Click the blue microphone in the top right corner and be sure to enter the code TWIT. But you have only until Friday, May 8th to take advantage of this special offer. And if you order by then, you can still get guaranteed deliver, delivery for Mother's Day. That's ProFlowers.com and use the code T-W-I-T. -T. We thank ProFlowers for their support on behalf of all TWIT listeners to all mothers out there. Happy Mother's Day. And one special, special offering from Leo Laporte. ProFlowers is it just you. about flowers. That's for you, Robert. <laughs> That's for you. Uh, see, uh, now I know that you love me. You really, really love me. <laughs> Folks, let's go ahead and get straight into the bites. This first one, well, I, I think I think we can all agree that this was some of the biggest news maybe after the Comcast Time Warner cable merger fallout. But shots have been fired. Google Fiber on wireless uh, on wireless carriers. Now Google launched Project Fi this week, and they officially became a mobile virtual network operator. And they've released the details of what the service will entail. It will first be available only for Nexus 6 users. It uses a SIM card that has access to both the T-Mobile and Sprint networks. It will work overseas. It's $20 a month for unlimited talk, text, Wi-Fi, tethering, international coverage, 10 gigabytes, $10 per gigabyte per month. And it's designed to automatically switch between LTE and Wi-Fi. Now, one of the cool features about this is you're only going to pay for the data that you use. It's not like a plan where you have to buy 5 gigs, and if you don't use the full 5 gigs, either you lose it or it will roll over. You're only going to pay for what you actually use. Let me throw this over to you first, Chibert. This has been something that we've been thinking about for a while. Google has been building out their capabilities with Google Fiber, with more data centers. They've been investing in technologies to deploy wireless technologies. Are, are you surprised or is it about dang time? I think it's about dang time and sign me up. Um, what got me was the international capability. That's the original reason why I went with T-Mobile because they're owned by Deutsche Telekom. But you know, having Google is making more and more sense and wow, about freaking time. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm the same way. But this deal is actually, I, I don't know if it's exactly what people think it is. It sounds like Google is getting into the wireless carrier business but that's never been Google's MO. They, they stick to their guns of being a company that organizes the world's information. Curtis, let me throw this over to you. One of the special bits about this new service is that the SIM chip will allow you to seamlessly switch between T-Mobile, Sprint, and Wi-Fi. In fact, they're depending on you using Wi-Fi an awful lot. 
that makes it more than just an MVNO, right? I mean, when you start thinking about the features that will be incorporated into this package, the ability to receive calls and hand them off between networks, having one single number that unifies all the devices you may use, this, this is actually an advanced unified communication system. Oh, it really is, uh, especially given the capabilities that exist on things like the Nexus 6 and the other phones in its category. Uh, if they can expand this to other phones, then all of a sudden Google becomes the gateway for millions of people to reach their wider area communications needs. Um, and I, I think it's a bit of brilliance. It is the sort of thing that uh, with any luck at all, it'll do exactly what Google seems to want it to do, and that is push the actual carriers to expand what they're offering and reduce the price they're charging for it. Exactly. And I think that's the angle that Google is actually taking. That's what they did with Google Fiber, and that's what they did with the actual with the Nexus line. The whole idea is we don't want to be insert thing here, a phone manufacturer. We don't want to be your broadband carrier. Now it's we don't want to be your cell service carrier. We just want the companies that are doing it to do it better. Chebert, I think that's why they've tied this plan to the Nexus. There's been a lot of people who are puzzled about this because this will work with any device that can use Google Hangouts. You don't actually have to use a Nexus. In fact, once you activate it, you could use this service on any device you have. But to me, They've tied it to the Nexus because they want to send the signal, this is the kind of device we want to see, and this is the kind of service we want to see. In other words, we want to see everything being transparent. We don't care about device. We don't care about service. We care that they get the mobile services that they want and the experience that they should get. Well, keep in mind, uh, I actually worked with a bunch of people, uh, in fact, Glenn Evans did too, where they were modifying high-end smartphones and building in the capability of roaming between Wi-Fi and cellular seamlessly and had background software to test which was going to give you the better um, MOS scores, you know, how, how good the connection was. This was actually a really, really tough thing to do because they had to reverse engineer a lot of the um, smartphone technology. Now, what Google's done is they're saying, yeah, that's a really good idea, but while we control the operating system, let's go and design it in and oh, by the way, mobile carriers, it's time for you to play catch up. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's going to be great. We've got uh, DLR in the uh, chat room. He's saying, yeah, Google is basically giving those companies a dope slap. And, and yeah, that's what it is. It's saying, wait a minute. Why are you making this so complicated? Why are you trying to squeeze every single pen, penny out of your customers when if you just offered better service, more people would subscribe and you'd actually make more money? We've seen this before. I mean, in fact, you can, you can attribute some of the nicest phones that we have on the Android side to Google's Nexus program. It wasn't until they, they released the Nexus that Samsung stepped up, that HTC stepped up, that, uh, that you got things like the OnePlus. Same thing on the Fiber side. With Google Fiber, it was kind of a curiosity. It was only going to be available in one city, but I think it really put the fear of competition into some ISPs that didn't have to worry about competition for such a long time. And now you've got things like cities that are being rapid deployed for high-speed internet because there's just the mention that Google might make its way in there. I'm hoping that the same thing will happen for wireless carriers. Curtis, what would you like to see? If, if this isn't really Google wanting to be a cell carrier, but Google wanting to inspire other cell carriers, what would you like to see in the next year? Well, I think the big thing that I'd like to see is this concept brought to a wider number of devices, including devices, <clears throat> pardon me, that the enterprise uses, uh, and, and that leans heavily towards iOS, uh, but, but also expand the number of carriers that are involved. Now, it's meaningful, I think, that this involves T-Mobile and Sprint, the two smallest carriers. Uh, it involves the two carriers that have already shown the capability of having phones that move between the wireless network and Wi-Fi. Uh, so this brings a lot of wins to everyone. It, it gives T-Mobile and Sprint more customers that they can claim they have, even if those customers come through Google. But what we basically need is lots more of this. I mean, face it, 
something like this writ large could dramatically change the way that enterprises, that contractors, and that consumers all use their wireless devices. I'm hoping that we see a little bit of fallout from this at Interop, where all three of us are going to be there the, this coming week. I, I want to see what vendors are going to do, especially since this seems to be a, a all rolled up, very well baked UC solution. Well, what is going to do to the competition landscape? Let's go ahead and move on to the next story. This one is a little bit different, but I wanted to include it. It's Facebook going after spammers and Twitter going after trolls. We know that social networking is becoming more and more important to the outreach of the enterprise. You just, you kind of have to do it. You have to play the game. Well, this past week, we learned that Facebook is going to be tweaking their algorithm so that your friends, the people you've actually liked, will show up at the top. Now, this is partially in response to some complaints that people were having that their feeds were just, they seemed like advertising. And Facebook doesn't want to drive away its users, at least not that much. But Facebook has another reason to do this. They're trying to cut down on spammers and like farms. This has sort of been a, a very poorly hidden secret on Facebook for the last couple of years, which is you'll have companies that will do absolutely everything they can. It's, it's their version of, of link baiting to get that like so that they'll show up higher and higher into people's feeds. It's, it's well worth it for them. Well, with this tweak, Facebook is essentially putting the kibosh on that. They're saying, well, you can have as many likes as you want, but we're still going to rank you lowly because the people actually don't care about you. Let me throw this over to you first, Hubert. This seems very counterintuitive because Facebook is essentially going to be ticking off the people who are paying Facebook for advertising. Why do you think they did this? Oh, I think it's a long line of they're getting really sick and tired of pissing everybody off. Um, you know, when you when you have all these people that are that are, you know, like what they're doing on Amazon, you know, false at you know false you know, five star reviews. What they're trying to do is, I think they're trying to do the right thing. You know, get away from the fake stuff. You know, if you the, the term is called a bounce. If someone goes to a web web page and immediately leaves, that means they didn't want to be there to begin with. Now, that's a lot of negative advertising because now people are going to say, well, Facebook is just full of trash. Why should I do it anymore? And people are abandoning Facebook in droves. People are looking at abandoning Twitter because they're sick and tired of all this crud that's been clogging up their, their social media. And so they're trying to keep the floodgates from opening by combating the cheaters. Let's call a spade a spade. They're trying to combat the cheaters that are trying to get false advertising or false um, ratings. Yeah. And they just don't deserve it. But, but Curtis, we call them cheaters, but this is kind of how the game is played. I mean, corporations, enterprises who want to advertise on Facebook, who want to appeal to the Facebook demographic, this is how they break in, right? They, they create a fan page, they get as many likes as they want, and maybe it starts getting offered to friends of the people who like their page. If that goes away then what incentive do they have to stay on Facebook? Well, I, I think it's important to note that the way Facebook is doing things, if you have legitimate users, I mean, if you're a business and you create a fan page and you have legitimate users who go to that fan page and re actually read what you've got there, then this doesn't penalize you at all. Where this penalizes you is if you have people who come in and create what are essentially robotic accounts to come in and like your page to make it appear far more popular than it is, which in the past would cause it to become more visible to people before they had gone to your page. So it's eliminating one way for people to game the system, and I, I think that's a good thing. I think one of the other things that this does is reinforce the fact that Facebook, like Twitter, is a mobile service. Let's face it, a lot of these things matter relatively little if you see them on a website on your laptop computer and you can just scroll past them. When you're dealing with the limited real estate of the mobile app, then these things matter a great deal. So Facebook is acknowledging that it's a mobile service and tweaking its algorithm to make sure that its mobile users 
get the most from the service and that the advertisers who legitimately appeal to those mobile users can reap the benefits. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's go ahead and move on to a, actually a corollary to the story because Facebook's not the only one dealing with uh, unwanted attention. Twitter has had a problem for quite a while with trolls. We just call them trolls, but they're really more than just people who are annoying. A dedicated troll, we know this, on Twitter can make dozens, hundreds, thousands of accounts to belittle, to harass, and to bully. Well, Twitter's been trying to crack down the last couple of months, and they've done a pretty good job. They've increased the rate of reporting. They've increased the ways that you can actually report a troll. And in the worst-case scenarios, they've, they've really done well with shutting down some of these accounts, as we saw with Gamergate, or the trolls who went after Kurt Schilling's daughter. Now, they just this week announced that they're making yet another change, not just to the service, but to the policies to make it easier to report trolls and to be more responsive to complaints. This was not just for individual users of Twitter, but if you if you actually look down through the white paper that Twitter released, it was because companies had started to complain that their accounts were being attacked in mass and there was really no way to combat one, two, three, a dozen people going after with thousands of accounts, making it look like there was a groundswell of hate. Uh, and, uh, well, Twitter's not going to lose them. Now, they're rolling out their biggest challenge, their biggest changes to combat trolls. They have a new bot that will actually search through tweets looking for negative connotations. That's not That alone is not going to ban an account, but they're looking for a continuous tone that might suggest an account is only being used to promote hate speech. They also can look at tweets sent after the same people again and again and again. So if you have a target that seems to be attracting a lot of the trolls, it increases the sensitivity level of hateful tweets coming at that. Uh, Twitter is being very, very clear that they're not trying to censor. They're just trying to make it more difficult for people to get through a message of hate. If you have a complaint, that's not going to it's not going to get stopped by the filter. But if you have dozens of accounts that are created all within minutes of each other, well, those accounts just make a auto-band. Oh, Chibert, again, I, I want to throw this over to you first because there's going to be people who are, who are wondering why are we talking about this on an enterprise show? But, but the three of us know because when you're talking about an enterprise show, you're also talking about the things that drive the business in the enterprise, and social media is one of the biggest. This problem with trolls has been on the forefront because it seemed as if it was impossible to stop them. There are a couple of companies like Facebook and Twitter that are actually starting to do it. Do you think it's going to be effective? I certainly hope so. You know, I've I've actually had a troll go after me and start blasting it. And it's like everything I said, it's, you know, I, I just ignored them. But it was certainly igno uh, very annoying. And I've seen trolls go after companies that really didn't deserve it. You know, I... What, what I really hate is when people, you know, don't research or they're, they're doing it for money. And it's like, wow, what's, what's going on? So why are you doing this? And it starts, it really makes a company look bad. And in the enterprise world, the enterprise is now living and dying by social media. And so, you know, if you're doing some sort of special event and all of a sudden there's a ton of negative tweets, it might affect continuing sales or it might affect people not going to a conference. It might affect people... Maybe, uh, maybe I won't try that because I'm hearing so many bad things. Unfortunately, social media really can make or break a corporation, and it is a very enterprise issue, um, and we need to be careful about that. Yeah. yeah Curtis, uh, I, actually, I, I want to take your expertise here again. Uh, I've, I've seen more and more IT people who are used to dealing with hardware, software, service problems being tasked to deal with what we would have traditionally considered a PR problem. When they see attacks on social media, I, I get I get emails from IT people saying, well, have, is there any software to deal with this? Is there a service that can help me? Is there something that I can integrate into my network to help fight these things off? Are, are you seeing more and more of that in the guests that you have on your shows? You know, we are because, uh, as you say, it's not just a question of, of perception. It's the ability of people who, for whatever reason, don't like you, your company, or what you're doing to create this virtual army of accounts that make it seem like uh, no one likes your company, that make it seem as though uh, there is this huge groundswell against you. 
and they can literally drown out the normal and whether it's positive or not um, more reasoned social media traffic that you depend on uh, it's going to be fascinating to me to see who complains the loudest about this policy because it's very difficult for someone to say well I enjoy going out and driving people to near suicide because I'm trolling them so badly that that's tough I suspect though what we're going to see is some social activist groups say that this prevents them from mounting campaigns against the corporations that are their targets I, I think that this is a very interesting first step on Twitter's behalf, and I agree with it. But I think that it's not nearly the end of this story. There, there's much more fallout to come. Well, gentlemen, when we come back, I want to dive into the RSA conference. It's actually happening just a couple blocks away from you. But before we do that, let's go ahead and th take a moment to thank the second sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech. And it's got to be... Pager duty. Now, the tech that we use in Enterprise gets more advanced each and every single year. Servers will fail over automatically, switches will route around outages, and storage has redundancies for redundancies of redundancies. But no matter how sophisticated our tools may become, things still break when we least expect them to. And when it impacts our customers, we want to be able to be woken from our deep sleep so that we can deal with the issues before they become a problem. A PagerDuty is an operations performance platform that delivers visibility and actionable intelligence to help increase the uptime of your apps, your servers, your websites, and your databases. PagerDuty connects all of your systems into a single view, allowing you to see critical events across all your monitoring tools. It's an essential service if your business needs your software and services to always be up. It has over 100 ready-to-use integrations, including Nagios, New Relic, Keynote, AppDynamics, or you could roll your own with PagerDuty's APIs. You can customize PagerDuty to fit how you and your team work, rather than trying to fit your schedule around a, the way a tool works. Now, here's how it actually goes. When there's an incident, PagerDuty will first look through all your monitoring tools, filter and deduplicate the alerts, and then only then will it alert the proper staff. This reduces noise and false alerts and makes sure that only actionable alerts are delivered. After reducing that noise, PagerDuty checks the on-call schedules and personalized alerting preferences to automatically alert the right team member and the right team. These alerts are dispatched by automated phone calls, SMS, email, and push notifications. PagerDuty is distributed across multiple data centers and multiple hosting providers, so your people will never miss an alert. It's not going to fall through the cracks. If alerts are missed because someone isn't responding, well, PagerDuty will automatically escalate the issue to another team member until it's responded to, which means 100% transparent failure. Folks, that's what we're looking for. All of this means that you can resolve incidents on the go while living your life, even when you're on call. And of course, PagerDuty isn't content to just tell you about the problems. Its analytic tools will also identify common problems, allowing you to proactively make system improvements and prevent future outages. PagerDuty is trusted by thousands of companies, including Microsoft, GitHub, Boeing, Nike, Pinterest, and Box. You should trust them too. Here's what we want you to do. We want you to get the right engineer on the right problem at the right time. Visit pagerduty.com slash twit to sign up for a free 14-day trial. And for as little as $19 a month, you can increase your uptime with PagerDuty. And when you sign up for a new account, you'll also get a free t-shirt. That's pagerduty.com slash twit. pagerduty.com slash twit. And we thank PagerDuty for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, gents, let's go ahead and talk about a different conference. I know that we're all getting set up to cover Interrupt, but RSA is going on right now. And there were a few interesting tidbits that uh, I think are worth mentioning. The first one was... Patrick Wardle, who is the director of research at security firm Synac, gave a presentation in which he claimed that it was trivial, trivial, to bypass XProtect and Gatekeeper, the security dynamic duo of OS X. Now, his exploit uses kernel-level vulnerabilities to bypass the sandbox that usually protects OS X. Now, he admits that the sandbox is strong, but he also says that the protections to keep something in the sandbox are actually pretty weak. 
one of the methods that you used to be able to use was to use an, unsi an unsigned app. So you could unsign a signed app and the loader wouldn't stop it from, from loading. That was supposed to be stopped with OS X Mavericks, but Wardle discovered that the check for the signature runs in user mode, which makes it pretty much useless because an attacker would also be in user mode, and the user could just modify a kernel extension or load an unsigned one. Chibert, let me throw this over to you. We're starting to see more and more of this. There's, there's, this, there's been a focus recently on demonstrating that the the unexploitable is actually quite exploitable is is that what we're seeing because a lot of rsa news was centered around os 10 and ios um give up <laughs> okay Boy, I tell you. you know for the longest time i always thought wow mac os 10 is great i've got less vulnerabilities and now i'm starting to see there's more vulnerabilities for mac os 10 uh, do i move to linux do i move to bsd do i move to cpm you know, is it time to give up? You know, I'm, I'm really starting to wonder, you know, it's like, wow, when is, when are we actually going to get ahead of this game? You know, I, I'm, I'm really going to refer back to Dan Gear. It's like, we need to reduce the attack surface and try and get ahead of the game. Um, it's more than a little frustrating if you ask me. Yeah, yeah, and especially since We've kind of trusted OS 10. It, it, actually, okay, let, let's be let's be fair here. OS 10, OS 10, if used properly, is a pretty dang secure operating system. It is not invulnerable, no matter what people may say, but but it does a lot to prevent you from doing stupid things. I think a lot of the demonstrations are just showing well what happens if you ignore all the warnings that it gives you and you do stupid things, which is that's going to affect any operating system. It probably just makes more news if it's OS 10 because it's it's Mac, uh, right, Curtis? Well, I think that that's very true, and and I think what we have here is, is something I, I've been in in a group that I'm part of. I've, I've been watching a rather heated debate over the past few days uh, concerning uh, the the relative vulnerability of Windows and Linux and Mac OS X. And the fact is, as we've seen demonstrated, if you misuse them, if you misconfigure them in the proper way, any of them are vulnerable. I have no doubt that, um, you know, IBM's mainframe operating systems are vulnerable if you misconfigure them in just the right way. But I think what we need to look at is how easy does the system make it to properly configure it? You know, does it default to more safe or less safe configurations? And so, you know, what you have here are, are two things. One is, yes, the fact that there are a lot of people who have been tired of what is fairly stated the smugness of many uh, Mac OS users who said that they're not vulnerable to say, see, you are truly vulnerable. And but we have to look at what they had to do in order to create the vulnerability. So. A lot going on. This is not something that's going to cause me to lose all faith. It's going to cause me to, you know, if anything, check to make sure that my configurations are still up to date. Let's quickly run through some of the other announcements that were made at RSA. Uh, there were two re security researchers by the name of Yamir, Yam Yair Amit and Adi Sharabani who disclosed an iOS attack that would affect iOS 8 and above to enter a constant reboot state when they were exposed to a Wi-Fi signal with a malformed security certificate. Now, they combine this with the Ygate exploit, which is well known, which can force iOS devices to automatically connect to a network. Uh, they created a access point that used that exploit along with a malformed security uh, certificate to make any iOS device within range of that wireless signal to constantly reboot. Now, that's a, that was an interesting an interesting hack. It wasn't permanent. It doesn't really brick the device, but uh, it was it was a uh, it was kind of fun to see that happen. Dan Gear was also at the conference, as uh, Chibert and I mentioned. We both had a chance to speak with him at Black Hat 2014, and he had suggested that we start moving to a model where we're releasing software on a more continuous basis so that we can take advantage of the honeymoon phase. That's that, that period. It could be weeks. It could be months. 
after new software is released when security researchers are combing through the code and combing through the software to find out if it has any vulnerabilities. His suggestion was that if we update quick enough, we will always stay in that honeymoon phase. Now, he altered that towards the end of his presentation to say, yes, of course, there's a downside that it never gets secure and it never gets really stable because of code churn. But he was wondering if it was possible to create code that could randomize at runtime. It was such a system would kill the current trends of attacks because you would never really have two installations that would be the same. You could create an exploit for a system, but the second it rebooted, it would no longer work. I think the big news, however, the one that we I do want to cover on this show, is that RSA President Amit Yoran told the conference attendees that we needed to look at security in a new way. Specifically, he un unveiled a five-fold plan for security. Now, here's the quote that I, I really liked. I was listening to his presentation last night. He said, We have sailed off the map, my friends, sitting here and awaiting instructions. It's no longer an option, and neither is what we've been doing. Continu continuing to sail on with our existing maps, even though we know the world has changed. Now, he has brought up a problem that we've been talking about on the show when we talked about the death of the firewall, that it's no longer an option to have perimeter security. The old maps are all about perimeter security. The old maps are all about having high-priced hardware that keep people out of our networks, and once you get in, you're in a trusted zone. Well, of course, that's no longer going to cut the mustard. And he said it's time for us to abandon that, but not just abandon perimeter security, but, and let me run through these, these, this five-fold plan really quickly. Number one, to stop believing in the silver bullet. There is no security that is 100% effective. Even advanced protections will fail, and we now need to assume that the attacker has breached our security. That's something, again, that we've talked about on Twite quite a bit. His second thing, and I'm paraphrasing all of this, is that it's time for full, continuous packet capture and 100% visibility of all endpoints. These are no longer nice to have, but are essential in modern security. He wants us to look at the bigger picture. Current strategies are focused on squashing intrusions as rapidly as they happen, but more and more, and he pointed out to Sony for this, we're seeing that attackers use obvious attacks to hide the less obvious. And if we attempt to stop every attack, then we're just teaching them how to breach our systems. His third point was that we need to sort out authentication and identity. It's about time. We should no longer allow overprivileged and dormant accounts to exist. His fourth point was that we need to use threat intelligence. Threat intelligence has a better view of the patterns of attack and can probably predict the next intrusion into our system before we see it. And the last point, and this is the one that got people thinking, was you can't be strong everywhere. It's time to rank your organizational assets and determine where dollars will be spent to protect them. Curtis, let me throw this over to you first. This is, I mean, it's, it's not an action plan, but this pretty much sums up the things that we've been talking about on Twight for security for the past three years. Oh, absolutely. And, and in many ways, this isn't new. You know, I was working with some security folks six years ago who were saying essentially the same thing, that you must assume that your system is vulnerable. And I think for us, that means not only the network of the enterprise, but individual endpoints as well. And so you, you're, you're left to do two things really well. One is to make sure that when an attacker gets in, there is no way for them to use the data they might find. And this gets back to the notion of encryption that we have had for as long as I've been part of TWIA. The other is that what we need are basically very active, very good intrusion detection and prevention systems where it is constantly monitoring the activity and flow of data, not only into our systems, but within and going out of our systems so that any kind of unusual behavior can be flagged and dealt with very quickly. The problem, you know, let's, let's think about Sony. If they had discovered the problem in the first hour, then none of us would ever have heard of this. The issue was that an attacker got in and was able to run around in Sony's network for months before they realized they had a problem. 
So being able to recognize what's going on, make sure that the data isn't useful. And um, I think that that number five is an interesting one. That, that's one I would love to talk about because I think you will have people who argue against that. But it's going to be interesting from an economic standpoint to see which side wins. Chiebert, I, I want to talk to you about his second point and his fourth point. That's the idea of using full continuous packet capture and observing what your attackers are doing. And then number four was the idea of using threat intelligence. Because the other items, one, three, and five, are about building out better systems, building out more secure systems, about setting them up so that you don't run into what Curtis was talking about, where you have an attacker behind the walls for months and months doing whatever he or she wants. But those two, number two and number four are about being smarter on how you defend yourself. Not, not buying more product, but actually taking the time to observe what an attacker is doing. I remember, uh, you, you'll remember this, Extreme brought a box. I can't remember what the name of it was. Centrian, the Centrian AG. And the whole idea of the Centrian AG was it was a firewall, intrusion protection, intrusion detection, but it was also a honeypot. So you could see what your attackers were trying to do and you could form some sort of defense based on what they did once they thought they got in. Is it is it time to go back to the honeypot era? You know, I'm not sure. There's there's a pretty big difference between defending and attracting. You know, I'm I'm not going to argue the point that we need to make it easier to prosecute and we need to have evidence and for that you actually have to record what's going on. Um, I kind of wish the products were a little less expensive. You know, in a budget scarce environment like academia, you know, a Infinish Dream from NetScout or something like that, those are not cheap devices. They're coming down in price, but they're not cheap. Um, I would want to pass on something I heard from a little bird at a friend at a firewall company who says, yeah, gone are the days where you can just, you know, you can just eke out just enough CPU in your firewall to do your thing. The Moore's law is really going crazy in the security business. And so now a lot of security companies are dramatically over designing their, um, the CPUs on their firewalls because they know they're going to have to keep up. It's not only bandwidth the driving, it's also the, the ability to have more and more security features kept on all the time. Uh, so I think we're heading in the right direction. I'm just not sure how we're going to get there and how much is it really going to cost. All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that cost. Curtis, that last point that you can't be strong everywhere, that's straight out of the art of war. You have to find out what it is that you need to protect the most. But how do you even decide that? I mean, what, what would a discussion like that look like? when someone's, If your IT manager were to come to you, if you were the, the CFO, the CTO, and say, well, you need to find the one thing we absolutely can't lose, we absolutely can't let slip out into the world, and then identify the 90% that I guess it's okay if it does, that doesn't sound like a really productive conversation. Well, I'm not sure that that is a particularly productive conversation, but there are similar conversations that, that can be productive. I mean, let, let's face it. With any organization, there are some pieces of intellectual property that are absolutely positively critical. Uh, if you look at a company like, say, Coca-Cola, the, uh, the famous recipe for Coca-Cola is on the, this must be protected at all costs. Uh, there are other recipes, you know, for their other beverages, including things like orange juice, that are just as important. Those recipes are really their critical IP that must be protected at all costs. You go down the scale and you get things like partner agreements, you get distribution agreements, you get their uh, internal financials, all of these things. All of those are important. And you can, with some degree of accuracy, assign values to those and say we want to make sure that whatever we do we protect these things we want to make sure that these other things are quite secure and then there are the things that are much less secure you know uh who's using a conference room on the fifth floor of the building on a given tuesday well that might not be the the most mission critical information to have so do you protect all of it equally well Probably not. Uh, and I think that's the, that's the key behind all of this. You know that your budget is not unlimited, so make sure that you're spending that limited budget where it's going 
to do the most good, which means where it's going to protect the information, where the loss or damage to that information would be the most damaging to the organization. Uh, the, the, the argument that I talked about comes out of the police world. And uh, I think many of us have heard this, um, the, the notion that broken windows matter, uh, that if you have a neighborhood where you allow broken windows to exist and not be repaired, that that cascades into worse and worse behavior. There are people who will argue that for enterprise security, that if you let any intrusion go by with, without hitting it you know, full force with the, the complete might of the organ organization, all guns blazing, that you're inviting more serious attacks. I don't think that's true. I understand the argument, but I don't agree with it. But that's the kind of discussion that you're going to have in the halls of a lot of corporations these days. I will just say that uh, I have very much enjoyed running a couple of honeypots. It's interesting to see what they catch. Now, uh, gents, when we come back, we've got about 10 or so minutes for you to, to tease us with what's going to happen at Interop. Uh, do, do you have your, your favorite stories? Have you been watching your feed? Uh, can, you, can you talk to the fans a little bit about what we'll be showing them? That's the two of you. Oh, of course. <laughs> going to be teasing like mad. All right. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the third sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you hiring? Are you looking for the right person to fill that job that you just need to have filled right now? Well, these days, hiring is more than just about finding a person with the right skills or the training. It's about finding a qualified candidate who can also fit into the culture of your business. I've done my share of hiring, and the process was always the same. You post a job, maybe you get into the newspaper, and get a couple of candidates, you interview them, and you hire them, and about half the time, you regret it. Well, the problem is that you need to cast as wide a net as possible because it's not just about finding someone who can do the job. It's about finding someone who can do the job in the culture of your business, which is why we're happy to have ZipRecruiter as a member of the Twiat Riot. Now, ZipRecruiter understands that posting your job in one place isn't enough to find quality candidates. If you want to find the perfect hire, you need to post your job on all the top job sites. And that's what ZipRecruiter does for you. With ZipRecruiter.com, you post your job once, and it gets placed on 50-plus job sites, including Craigslist, LinkedIn, and Twitter, all with a single click. ZipRecruiter will help you find candidates in any city or industry nationwide. Just post once and watch your qualified candidates roll in to ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. And now ZipRecruiter offers Traffic Boost, which can get you up to three times as many qualified candidates for your job opening. There will be no juggling of emails or calls to your office. Instead, you'll quickly screen candidates, rate them, and hire the right person fast. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by over 200,000 businesses. And right now, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. For a free four-day trial, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twiet. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash twiet. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, gentlemen... Let's get back to the reason why you're in the middle of what sounds like either a gun range or a warehouse. It's Interop, and you folk are the vanguard. You're there setting up, making sure that we can cover all the goodies that come out of the most advanced tempering network in the world. Tell me, what are you looking forward to? Chibert, let's start with you. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to spending some time in the software-defined networking um, iLabs area. That's... Uh got some incredible promise. They're going to be separate pods with different solutions, and they're actually going to be working towards figuring out how to make them interoperate, which I think a lot of our viewers will agree that is the holy grail for software-defined networks. Uh, Achiever, uh, describe iLabs, because there are people who have never been to Interop, and they, they have no idea what an iLabs is, but it's actually it's, it's a pretty revolutionary idea. Well, the whole the, the concept of iLabs is that we do have a production network. That's what, we, that's what we're building right now. But in addition, we highlight a technology that's emerging, the bleeding edge, the technology that's not quite baked yet. And so we get to highlight that, we get to set it up, we have vendors involved showing off their gear, but they're working on trying to figure out how to make it talk to other people. You know, the interoperability isn't dead. You know, a lot of people say, well, Interop's just a production. No, Interop has the iLabs where we get to work on 
new technology, stuff that hasn't emerged yet, hasn't fully baked, and it kind of forces, it throws the vendors together to rub shoulder to shoulder and actually work towards a common goal because in the in the end, it all it needs to interoperate somehow because the day of a single vendor solution, I don't know. I don't know too many people that have single vendor and the iLabs is a catalyst for that. Yeah. You know, the, the thing that I've always liked about iLabs is, let's see, they, they did wireless before wireless became a thing. They did VoIP before VoIP became a thing. And actually, they did SDN before any of the standards had even come out or before people even knew why they would want SDN. I remember that summer because they had to appeal to a bunch of different manufacturers from Cisco and Juniper and Extreme and, and Netgear trying to get boxes, switches that could become SDN switches. They had to load a specialized firmware. And one of the things I really love was the fact that you could walk up to the, to the iLabs area of the show floor and you could speak to engineers who actually put the stuff together and they weren't invested in any of the hardware. They didn't represent the companies that were there. They represented the technology. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, I think that's one of the things that draws me back to Interop year after year. So what about it, Curtis? What is the thing that's pulling at your Interop heartstrings? Well, like Brian, I'm very interested in seeing what's going on with the SDN lab. You know, this is one of those areas we've been talking about for quite a long time, but it's nice to be actually seeing product and seeing product work together. Another thing that I'm really looking forward to, it seems like we're getting a lot of interest in two things. One is monitoring from the user point of view, uh, being able to tell the network engineer what's going on out at the endpoint before the end users call in to complain. And the other is that wonderful tying of on-premise technology to the cloud. So lots of cloudy stuff going on here at Interop. That's another area I'm going to be wandering around seeing what's going on. All right. Uh, for me, uh, the, looking through some of the PR announcements that have been blasted to my email accounts, uh, yeah, SDN is definitely going to be a big topic. Another big topic is they've actually already started picking up on the failure of the Comcast Time Warner uh, merger. And I'm starting to get PR releases that are kind of aimed in that direction. Do you want to see what might be the next confluence of connection technologies and companies? So I, I want to see if we're going to get any news from uh, the big ISPs that show up to the show. Now, uh, this is how it's going to work. So, uh, gents, next week we're going to be pre-recording an episode at the show. We're not going to do it live because, unfortunately, we start tearing down the show on Friday. And actually, next Friday is going to be Microsoft Build Day, so it's going to be crazy in the studio. So instead, we are going to give you an hour of, uh, of show, starting off as we normally do, just discussing the news. But then we're going to spend the entire second half of the show taking you physically through the different spots that make up the Interop network, talking to the engineers who put it together, taking a look at what the show floor looks like. We're, we're even going to give you behind the scenes and after dark footage. And I'm probably going to be flying a quadcopter around the space because the guards can't stop me. But uh, are the two of you, are you down with that? I mean, even if I get arrested? Yes, Quad Father, we are with you. <laughs> and I do have bail money with me. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, that's it. The die has been cast. Gentlemen, we will be there at Interop. I want to thank everyone for being here for this hour of the best dang enterprise podcast in the world. That's according to nine out of ten security experts. Uh, could you please tell the folks where they can find you when you're not sitting in a really noisy warehouse slash factory slash convention center? Chebert, where can the Twilight Riot go to find your work? Well, I am I'm more than happy to talk to people on Twitter. I'm at ADV NetLab, Advanced NetLab. But I tell you, coming up this week at Interop, come and say hi. I'm actually going to be speaking once an hour in the Past Solutions booth, talking about the Aloha Cabled Observatory and talking to some of the other people that are using the Past Solutions technology to solve problems. Speaking of solving problems, you're going to be doing some problem solving on Information Week Radio, Curtis. Where can people find you and your show? I understand you're, you're doing 11 shows in eight days or something like that? That's right. As a matter of fact, we begin a little bit later today, uh, Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. I'll have my first live radio show from here on the floor. We're also doing a bunch next week. You can go to informationweek.com, check on the uh, Interop tab 
to get all the information on when those are going to be happening. Or you can just follow me on Twitter at KG4GWA. I'll be tweeting out the URLs ahead of time. Would love to have you listen. And if you're going to be at Interop, uh, just look up Kurt's Corner on the knock. I'd love to have a chance to meet you. In fact, uh, if you're in Interop, make sure to say hello to the 3S. We may be working, but we always love to speak with our fans. Well, gentlemen, I will see you in a few hours. Thank you very much for being part of Twyatt. You know you are the heart and soul. And I also want to thank you. That's right, the person who comes back each and every single week to listen, to watch, to, to just bask out in the geekiness that is Twyatt. We want to do a little something for you. And that little something is to make it easy for you to get all of our episodes automatically. If you go to our show page at twit.tv slash Twyatt, You'll find not just all of our back episodes, including the notes from each episode, but also a place where you can get a little drop-down menu so that you can get the audio version, the video version, the high-definition video version into your iPhone, your iPad, your Mac, your PC, your laptop, your desktop, your tablet, whatever it may be, we're going to give you a file because, well, we love you. Speaking of the ways that we love you, did, did you know that we love you live? That's right. Every Friday at 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific time, you can find us at live.twit.tv. And as long as you're watching live, why not jump into the chat room at irc.twit.tv? It's part of the experiment that is the Twit TV network. Also, did you know that you can follow me on Twitter? If you follow me at twitter.com slash PadreSJ, that's at PadreSJ, you'll find out what we're going to be doing for every episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. You'll be able to suggest guests and topics for future episodes, and you get to see what I'm doing when I'm not on the stream. Again, it's part of the interactivity that is Twit TV. Finally, I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible. Of course, to Leo, to Lisa for letting me do Twyatt, to Carson, my super producer, and to my... I can't call him a super TD. We're going to have to... Hey, you know what, chat room? We're going to have to come up with a name for Zach because he can't give himself his own nickname. That's right. Eskimo Zach, if he can find his camera, could you please tell the Twyatt right where they can find you? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Eskimo Zach. That's E-S-K-I-M-O-Z-A-C-H. Thank you, Padre. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas there, just reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise... Just keep quiet.